Thanks for the introduction. Um, so in this talk, I'll present work that I did with my co-authors, Jan Kamenisch and Maria Dibovitskia. And I'm going to start talking about credentials. So very often, some authority uh, issues credentials to users, stating something about their attributes. I live in Switzerland now, so I'm going to talk about the Swiss government issuing ID cards to Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And the issuer could, for example, issue a statement saying, um, Alice, um, this is, her name is Alice, she was born on uh, January 28th in 1984, and her address is some street in Zurich, um, with some sort of a signature on it to verify this claim. And now, um, and now Alice might go to the liquor store to buy a drink, um, but she would have to prove that she's old enough to buy alcohol. Now, luckily, she has this digital credential issued by the, by the Swiss government that she can show to the, to the liquor store, and uh, which contains her date of birth, so they can figure out if she's old enough to buy alcohol. However, there's a bit of a problem here. Here, uh, Alice would disclose her full credential, um, which gives way too much information about her to the liquor store. All it needs to know is that Alice is over 21, um, but what, what Alice is proving is that, uh, that the Swiss government issued her a credential on her name, her date of birth, and her, her address even. So we have a privacy problem. We're disclosing way more than we should. Luckily, there is a solution. And this is anonymous credentials. So if we now consider that the Swiss government issues anonymous credentials to Alice, Bob, and Charlie, then we can do something much more privacy friendly. Again, Alice goes to the liquor store and wants to prove that she is old enough to buy alcohol. But now she uses the fact that she has a, a, an anonymous credential. So what she can do is make, um, prove a statement by saying, here's a blinded version of my credential uh, that proves that I'm over 21 years old, and this is uh, issued to me by the Swiss government, but I'm not going to show you anything else. And now the magic of anonymous credentials is that you can still verify such a claim cryptogra cryptographically only using the public key of the Swiss government. So only using the key of the issuer of the credential. And this is fantastic because now Alice only proves exactly what she needs to prove. She proves that she's old enough, uh, but nothing else. So all her attributes remain hidden. And uh, even if she comes back to the store, uh, the store cannot distinguish whether she's a new customer or a returning customer. So this is Really, we are disclosing the minimal amount of information, which is fantastic for privacy. Uh, these anonymous credentials have been around for more than 15 years already and are also used in practice in many different places. One interesting example is that uh, Intel SGX's remote attestation mechanism is based on, on this technology. So these anonymous credentials are really nice, but they also have their limitations. Um, it's, often it's the case that there's not one issuer issuing credentials to all the users. Very often, an issuer delegates some, some uh, issuing rights to smaller authorities. For example, in Switzerland, Switzerland is like, um, like the United States. It consists of, uh, of many different states. And maybe the Swiss government uh, delegates the power to issue such cards, such, such digital credentials, to the, to the local states, to the cantons, instead of doing it all himself. And now it might be that Alice lives in Zurich, so she gets a credential issu issued from the state of Zurich, and Bob is in Geneva, and Charlie is in Basel, so they all get a credential uh, issued by a different issuer. And now anonymous credentials are not enough to obtain privacy. We again consider Alice trying to prove that she's old enough to buy alcohol, and even if she has an anonymous credential issued by the state of Zurich, then um, the, to verify that statement, the public key of the issuer, so the state of Zurich, is required. And clearly, now the liquor store will know that, um, that Alice is from Zurich. So we're no longer disclosing the minimal amount of information. We are giving extra information away about, about who we are. And this is no longer minimal disclosure. Now, you might say this is not such a big deal. I mean, Zurich is still big. But um, maybe permission blockchains are another example uh, that are more convincing of why we need such privacy. In permission blockchains, 
um, permission blockchains differ from uh, public blockchains like the Bitcoin um, in the sense that users require credentials to use the blockchain. So in order to invoke a, a transaction or a smart contract, you need to prove that you're a member of this permission blockchain. And typically, in such uh, permission blockchains, many different companies come together uh, uh, to, to do something with smart contracts, and they usually don't trust each other. Because that is, uh, if, if they would trust each other, then they, could, then they don't need a blockchain. So maybe company A brings in certain users, and company B brings in certain users, and they all issue credentials to their own users themselves. So we have multiple issuers, again, issuing credential, membership credentials for this permission blockchain. And very often, we want to use blockchains for, for use cases uh, regarding privacy. So we might want to hide who is invoking a transaction or a smart contract. And even with anonymous credentials, such scenarios cannot uh, hide from which company a certain user would be, because the, the issuer of the credential would be in the clear. So many scenarios where you would hope to get privacy, um, anonymous credentials are not enough to, to uh, fulfill those privacy requirements. What we, what we need here are delegatable anonymous credentials. And in delegatable anonymous credentials, we can have one root issuer, uh, and then one or more intermediate issuers, and then a, a user, and the user can prove that he has a credential while only revealing the public key of the root issuer. So in our example, Alice can prove she has a credential from the Swiss government while hiding that the, uh, the canton of Zurich was the intermediate issuer. This, this, um, these delegatable anonymous credentials were introduced in 2006 already by Chase and Lysianskia, um, and they also had a construction already. Um, it was a little bit limited in the sense that you can only have a, a constant or a fixed number of, of delegations because uh, the credential size would blow up exponentially in the delegation depth. But later work by Belinke et al. and Fuchsbauer and Chase et al. solved that problem um, such that you can have uh, a long chain of issuers uh, while still being polynomial. However, um, these schemes are not very efficient, but more importantly, they don't support attributes. So you can have a credential or you don't have a credential, but you cannot encode more information in one credential. So you cannot have, uh, yeah, you, we cannot put attributes in there and selectively disclose them. And that's what we're going to add today. So we introduce um, a scheme for delegatable anonymous credentials that supports attributes uh, and is very efficient. So with our scheme, we can do, um, the Swiss government can issue to the canton of Zurich a credential with one attribute saying the canton here is Zurich. And the canton of Zurich can uh, give Alice a digital credential certifying her attributes. And then Alice will end up with a level two credential, so two steps away from the root issuer that contains uh, both the attributes in the first level of the credential, so the fact that the canton is Zurich, and the attributes of the second step, so that her name is Alice and she's uh, her birth date and address. And this is still an anonymous credential. So Alice can uh, selectively disclose all attributes that a credential has. So she can, for example, uh, if she wants to prove her age, she can black out all her attributes and only prove that her date of birth is more than 21 years ago. And such a claim is then verifiable using only the public key of the Swiss government. So the fact that she got it from the uh, canton of Zurich will remain hidden. Okay, so this is what we want to achieve. Of course, we first need a security model to, to know what we're really trying to get. And we choose to define security in the simulation-based paradigm, which differs from the more common game-based uh, definitions. The advantage of, um, so a simulation-based definition is um, a definition where you define a sort of ideal tr third party, a trusted third party that uh, performs the task that you want to do in a secure way by construction. And a protocol is secure if it's as secure as this by construction uh, uh, third party. And we choose this because this allows for universal composition. So if you, um, if you fulfill our security definition, 
then what is guaranteed is that um, you can use this protocol as a building block to a higher level protocol or use many instances in parallel and then it'll be guaranteed that security is maintained. If you do um, other security definitions with, with game-based definitions, that is no, not necessarily true. So you would need to prove something more. So in this sense, we have a stronger security definition than prior work. But in another sense, we, have, we, we take a bit of a shortcut. So existing security definitions for delegatable anonymous credentials considered um, privacy in delegation. So if Alice delegates a credential to Bob, then uh, Alice and Bob might not know each other's identity, but they might know each other by pseudonyms instead. And this is, this is of course, very strong. This is a very uh, flexible definition, uh, but it's also very hard to achieve. So that is one of the reasons that existing solutions are not so efficient. And um, we actually think that it's not very important to have this property. We think that in, in, in the vast majority of the practical uh, use cases of this, you would typically know to whom you're giving a credential. So from our security definition, we, we omit this privacy during uh, delegation uh, and just assume that you, you, you're allowed to know each other. And this allows for a very uh, simple definition of security and opens the door for much more efficient instantiations. So I'll give you a quick intuition of how this ideal functionality, this, this idealized uh, uh, trusted third party works, which is our definition of security. So um, the Swiss government, now the parties will give their inputs to this, to this ideal functionality and um, the Swiss government may start by issuing a credential to the Canton of Zurich, and the Canton of Zurich can delegate that to Alice. And now this trusted, this ideal functionality will of course prevent issuing a or delegating a credential that you don't have. What's more interesting is how we define anonymity. So Alice might say that she wants to sign a message while proving that she has a level two credential with, a, with an age over 21 years old. Now the functionality must well, first, it'll check that Alice indeed has a satisfying credential. Otherwise, our such statements would, be mean, would, would not mean anything. But then what's interesting is we need to give, um, we need to give an anonymous token uh, which represents the cryptographic proof that you have such a credential. The, the ideal functionality must give such a token. And for that, we use local computation in the functionality. So the functionality has some algorithm um, that can create such tokens and the, the, the interesting thing is that that only takes as input the public information of the proof. So it only takes as input the fact that she's signing M and proving that she's older than 21, but nothing more. And this means that uh, the token cannot depend on things that we're trying to hide, such as the, uh, the other attributes of Alice or her exact date of birth. So this way we, give, we make an anonymous token in our security definition and of course, the, the verifier can verify such tokens, um, which is very similar to how existing uh, signature functionalities work. So you, you may basically uh, prevent a forgery and that's it. So this is, our, this is a security we're trying to achieve. Now we can look at how we're gonna, how we're gonna realize it. So we're gonna look at our construction. And the high-level intuition behind this is actually very simple. Everybody starts by creating uh, a secret key and a public key. And to issue a credential, the Swiss government places a signature on the, on the, on the public key of the Zurich Canton. It signs the public key and the attribute value. Now, this, now the, the, um, the Canton of Zurich will have a level one credential, so directly from the issuer, which consists of that signature, the attribute values, and its own keys. And now it can delegate a cr that credential to Alice by signing Alice's public key with its secret key. And it also signs Alice's attribute values. And then Alice ends up with a, with a level two credential, which consists of both the first link of the credential, so the first signature made by the government of Switzerland, and the second signature made by the uh, Canton of Zurich. And all the attribute values in both of those signatures. 
And now Alice wants to make those proofs. She wants to present her credential to a verifier, to the liquor store. So she wants to prove that she has a level two credential with an H attribute in it, which is more than 21 years ago. And this is a two-step uh, two thing. So first, um, she signs the message that she wants to sign while disclosing these attributes with her own secret key. And then she makes the large zero knowledge proof. What she does is, um, so in the zero knowledge proofs, she proves the, the, these relations that I show on the right, but all the blue values remain hidden. She only proves knowledge of these values without disclosing them. So what she proves is that the issuer signed uh, some public key and the attribute Zurich, and that under that public key, she has a signature on her own public key and certain attribute values, and that her age attribute is more than 21 years ago, and that with her public key, she, or under her public key, she signed the message M. But while, but she, dis, she doesn't disclose these values, she just proves that she knows values that satisfy these equations. And now a verifier will be, because these zero knowledge proofs are sound, the verifier will be convinced that, um, that the statement is true, but, but he will not learn anything about, about Alice's hidden attributes. So we, we fulfill the anonymity requirements that we set out to achieve. So now what remains is instantiating these, these building blocks that, that we had. Um, we, um, we have, so we have our construction relies on signatures and on zero knowledge proofs. So both these two things, we need to choose uh, efficient instantiations, such as our overall protocol will be uh, efficient. So for the signature, we use Grot's structure preserving signature uh, from Azure Grip 2015. And if you know that signature scheme, so we want to use this to make credentials. And if you know the signature scheme, then you know that with a public key in G2, you sign messages in G1, a different group. So we need to, if Alice wants to sign Bob's public key, then you need to have public keys in different groups. However, we can just alternate G1 and G2, so one has a, they make public keys in different groups, and then things are compatible and, works out, and work out. And then we use the very efficient Schnorr zero-knowledge proofs in the random oracle model to make them non-interactive. Um, to make this proof about uh, a credential presentation. And with this together, we get a very efficient instantiation. So to prove that you have such a delegated credential, so a level two credential, um, you need to compute five exponentiations in G1, five in G2, and four in the target group. Um, and if you want to add attributes to it, you add some more uh, you add some more exponentiations. And verification only costs four pairings and four exponentiations in the target group, and again, some extra if you, wanna, if you wanna have additional undisclosed attributes. And we, we made a, a prototype implementation of this, and that showed that you can compute this in only 27 milliseconds and verify this in 20 milliseconds. So we think that this is very practical. This is without attributes, if you wanna add, uh, if you want to add more undisclosed attributes, then um, the time to compute this, this proof increases with five milliseconds for attributes in G1 and 10 milliseconds for attributes in G2. And the verification time increases with five milliseconds. But so overall, we think that this is, this is in tens of milliseconds, so this will be fast enough for many practical uh, real-world applications. So that will bring me to the conclusion. We've seen that um, hierarchical issuance is very common. We typically don't have one issuer, but we have uh, multiple issuers issuing credentials, and anonymous credentials are not enough to provide privacy there. So for example, if ID cards are issued by local governments or in uh, multiple issuers issuing membership credentials for permission blockchains, anonymous credentials are not good enough to offer privacy there. What we need is delegatable anonymous credentials. We introduced a new security model for delegatable anonymous credentials with attributes um, and propose a new efficient construction. So our construction is efficient, has attributes, and is universally composable, meaning you can use it in any environment or setting you like, such that it's still secure.
So if there's one thing you're going to take away from this talk, then it should be that delegatable anonymous credentials are now practical, they're fast enough to be used, and if you have a setting where there's multiple issuers, then uh, delegatable anonymous credentials can give you privacy. Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, so one question about the, the privacy motivation. I mean, it seems to me that the, the delegatable anonymous credentials are, are very powerful as a, as a primitive, but if your goal is just to um, keep the privacy of which issuer gave you your credential, then it would seem that it would be easier to give it, or, or just as easy to give it construction where you just did an or proof over all the issuers. Is the, is the problem that, you, that there's going to be uh, possibly many issuers, so it would be less efficient than having... Yeah. The, okay. So, so if, if you would have... Um, uh, I mean, you're right. This, is a, this, this would also solve the problem. Mm -hmm. um, but so if you have two issuers, then it might, it might work. But if you have uh, 10 issuers, it's going to be very inefficient already. And if you have even more, then mm -hmm. there's no way, probably. Right. And the point is it wouldn't be... The, the construction itself wouldn't be, much, wouldn't be much more efficient than what you can get with, with uh, delegates. No, it would be much slower, in fact. Yeah, well... Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, depending yeah. On, uh, on the amount, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Um, so in this scheme, you, you showed that there is good performance for the uh, verification side and uh, verifying those proofs uh, in terms of uh, computational complexity, but um, I'm, I'm, this is not my area at all, so maybe I'm saying something that doesn't make any sense. In terms of space uh, yeah. that is required for the verifier to actually process these, uh, these verification, are there any limitations, or is this something that somebody could use, for instance, to launch a denial of service attack on a verifier? Uh, like, so, send so something bogus and just let the, the other guy try to verify constantly stuff that makes no sense. So you're... you're if I, if I understand you correctly, you're afraid that you could use, you could send the verifier bogus claims and then it would waste time verifying. Mm, waste time um, and maybe space, because you didn't say anything about space, so. Well, okay, yeah, so, I mean, it's very easy to recognize elements that are in the right group. So this, getting the structure right is not, is not hard. Uh, and, yeah, and then it will take, at most, those 20 milliseconds we showed. So, uh, yeah, I mean. You can send him many things that'll take 20 milliseconds, but there's not. You cannot easily send him something with a weird structure that would that okay. would make him waste more time. Okay, thank you. Um, I believe the ZK proof are big in size, several kilobytes. Are they? Uh, no. So um, the ones that we suggest are, are, are not large at all. Uh, I don't have the exact numbers on these slides, but um, for such a level two credential that I've been talking about, uh, if I remember correctly, it'll be maybe 10 group elements. So 10 times 256 bytes, uh, bits. Okay. So it really not, it's not near kilo or megabytes. Okay, and next question, if someone um, in the middle hijacks the session and he knows ZK proofs, can he replay the proof and pretend to be Alice? Um, okay, so I think I need to make some space here. So, um, you sign, you sign a message with this construction, right? So if, if you want to authenticate, then you, I would give you a nonce, and you would have to give me a signature back. Okay. So it's an interactive so, ZK proof. So, so this, no, sorry. Okay, so this, 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 this zero knowledge proof is non-interactive. So if I sign, I can sign a message while proving that I'm over 21. So if you have this, this message, then that will still be valid. But if we want to use it as an authentication protocol, then I would make you sign a nonce and you would give me a proof back. And then, of course, one existing proof will be worthless to you. So you could not authenticate as Alice or as using her credentials. Okay, thank you.